we're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hello, I'm Christina Henderson, Executive Director of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. Welcome to our webinar, Montana Biotech Companies to Watch, New Frontiers of Science. This event is part of a series of virtual events the Alliance is hosting. You can find the full schedule at mthitech.org slash events. Today's webinar is co-hosted by the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative, and today we are pleased to highlight the work of three Montana companies that were just named Montana Biotech Companies to Watch. We'll be conducting this webinar in a Q&A format. I will serve as moderator, and if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box or unmute your microphone if you wish to speak. We would ask that you stay muted during the presentations unless you have a question. Uh, and we also have a few questions that we've collected in advance. Um, to kick things off, we would like to have each of our company CEOs uh, say, uh, take a few minutes to tell us how you got started and what you do. I will have you go in the order in which I say our, your names. Our speakers today are Elizabeth S. Corbin, the CEO of Pure Cell Bio in Bozeman, Carl Sebi, President and co-founder of Truel in Whitefish, and Andreas Scherer, President and CEO of Golden Helix in Bozeman. And I'd now like to turn the floor over to Tess Corbin to get us started. Hi, good morning. My name is Elizabeth Corbin, but I do go by Tess. Um, I guess if you had to put who I am and why I'm here in one word, it would be mother. I was in 2004, the desperate mother of a dying child. And uh, one of my colleagues used that as uh, he said some of his best supporters were desperate parents of dying children. <laughs> so my son, my oldest, was diagnosed when he was five with a congenital enzyme disorder for which there was no cure or, or reasonable therapy. Um, so I started to work on it. I was an undergraduate then in chemistry, planning on being a teacher, and uh, started with my biochemistry to apply everything I could learn and everything I could learn to look at <laughs> to try to save my son's life. Um, and so I did that for, I've been doing that now for 20, let's see, 16 years. He's currently 21 years old and uh, he is fine. So during the course of my undergraduate program and the beginnings of my graduate program in biochemistry, which I attended also because of this direction that I wanted to help my son. And as I learned more about it, I learned that uh, these enzyme disorders are very rare individually, but as a class, they're very prevalent in our communities. Uh, and so I thought, well, I need to find a way to help my son and I found stem cells. So during my undergraduate program, I realized that stem cells were going to be the answer for people with genetic disorders because viral therapies and things like that were had issues that as a parent, I wasn't willing to expose my child to. So I began working with IPSC induced pluripotent stem cells under the auspices of first Dr. Dratz at uh, Montana State and then Renee Ray Hopera came in with her Stanford stem cell lab and I was blessed to be able to work with them for four years. Uh, so what I discovered in the course of this was that the problems with stem cells and our process of reprogramming adult cells to stemness and then turning around and making them into another cell type, a huge part of the problem was that we had signaling interference, we didn't have good efficiency. So I started looking at how we were doing it and what I figured out uh, just over a course of many years, which we won't go into here, is that uh, the biggest issue that we have in stem in culture of cells in general is the use of cow serum to supplement media. Cow serum is designed to create a baby cow and every chemical and cytokine that's included in that serum is there in order to promote the creation of a baby cow. And so then we put that into a dish of human, uh, human skin cells and we want them to turn into stem cells. So we give them four little cytokines and there's thousands in there screaming to be a baby cow. So I developed a line of chemically defined supplements with all the ingredients I could figure out that the different cell types needed out of serum. And I found a way to uh, solubilize these because serum provides the hydrophobic nutrients and started adding them to different cell types, the ones that I was going to reprogram and using them in the reprogramming process. And I discovered that I had something that was really good. It was growing cells better than serum. And the, it was just, it, the 
reprogramming was 1200% better, which made me believe I had cleared up some of the signaling interference. But then I went to a, a seminar back in Vermont and presented to some other cell people and they all went nuts because I had also eliminated a huge source of contamination. There's a laundry list of contaminants that have to be proven absent in order for any biotech, a product of cells or the cells themselves to go to human application, whether that's therapy or lab meat or making vaccines or anything. And those are very expensive, but also we have a new class, relatively new class of uh, contaminants called prions that cannot be tested for. So with my chemically defined alternative for fetal bovine serum, which is a line of products, um, one for each cell type, because cell types have different nutritional needs, uh, we increase cell proliferation, we eliminate contamination, <laughs> and we eliminate things like having to sell, send things on dry ice, um, and we reduce the variability that's always been associated with serum. So my company began, and here we are. We're still in development, optimizing things and setting up a new lab out in Belgrade, but that's where we sit now. Phenomenal, thank you. Uh, now we'll go to Carl. Okay, can you hear me all right? Okay, so hi, uh, I'm Carl Sevy. I'm the president and co-founder at Truel. Um, first, thank you, Christina and Martina and the rest of the Montana High Tech Alliance team for putting this together and including me as a panelist. So I'm really appreciative to be here. So Truel is an openly accessible community focused online platform to access and share computational methods in, in genomics. So as some people on this call are aware with current instrumentation and streamlined sample preparation, sequencing technology has really become accessible to any reasonably equipped lab, um, which has just led to incorporation of sequencing and geno genomics into all fields of biology that have any, or really any field that has to do with living things, everything from medicine, which is a you know, huge umbrella, um, synthetic biology, agriculture, conservation, ancestry, natural history, and of course, even just um, basic research and understanding how biology works. So this has led to an explosion in both the volume and diversity of sequencing data that is and will be produced. Um, however, the ability to collect genomic um, sequencing data is far outpacing our ability to understand it. And once the data is collected, there's usually a big knowledge gap on how to answer scientific questions from the data, um, as that usually requires a significant amount of um, computational expertise, which people in life sciences field tend not to have. So my background is not in bioinformatics, but in physical and analytical chemistry. And as I was moving into research that involved genomics, I found that it was fairly straightforward to get samples we needed and to work with sequencing centers to collect data. But once you get that data, it was extremely complicated to find and use computational methods needed to look for insights in that data. So in our case, we wanted to start by re-implementing and expanding on some analyses um, that were reported by a large research consortium called the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. So we spent a lot of time digging through the literature, tracking down a lot of different programs that were scattered around the internet and tried to put them together to kind of redo a whole analysis. Um, however, the way computational analyses are reported tend to be very incomplete. You have no idea what versions of programs were used, what parameters, settings people are using, how much computing resources you need, what form the input files should look like, and what kind of output files you really expect. Um, and we found that wanting and failing to use computational methods that others developed uh, and uh, that others develop and want to use is really a common problem in the genomics research field. So we started Tool to allow people to share their computational, me computational methods and how they use those methods in a much more complete, understandable, and reusable way. So we say we're openly accessible because we've gone to quite a bit of effort to make the content on the platform findable by search engines. So you can just Google what you're looking for and get to Truel rather than having to go through login page and uh, explore the platform. Uh, we say it's community focused because the content is posted and associated with users. So if you post a method or use case of it, you, retrieve, uh, you receive kind of attribution uh, for your contributions. And we have a whole suite of community features, including you know, things like commenting, bookmarking content, um, getting unique identifiers that you can easily share with others. 
And this really helps to facilitate open collaboration on a global scale. And we make content more findable by enabling filtering by um, tags or um, by what specific users have posted and, and include complete sets of metadata that make things easier to find with search engines. And we also make methods more usable by experts and non-experts alike. Um, we have several popular genomics workflows on the site, which can be launched directly on the cloud through the platform. So um, as this is the Montana, Montana High Tech Business Alliance, I'd like to mention that our whole founding team has very strong Montana roots. Um, so Tim Thompson, one of our co-founders, was born and raised in Plentywood, Montana. Joby Rudolph, co-founder and CTO, was born and raised in Billings and did his um, degree in computer engineering at Montana State University. I wasn't born here, but uh, I came here first to Bozeman as part of a research experience for undergraduates program and then just come, kept coming back. Um, I did my graduate degree at Montana State University and then married a Montanan and now my kids on my wife's side are now fourth generation whitefish. So um, very strong ties to Montana and we're super happy to be here. Thank you, Carl. Andreas? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Christina, for the introduction. And um, after these few words, you already know this is not a Montana accent. <laughs> um, I was, uh, as you can tell, born in Germany. I got my degrees there. I have a PhD in computer science um, with a minor in medicine. And uh, about eight years ago, um, I invested in a company that my friend uh, started, uh, Golden Helix. <laughs> the company um, has, under my leadership, focused on the clinical application of analytics software in the uh, healthcare space. So what we specifically do is we build testing pipelines for hospital and testing labs uh, that use genomic information to study hereditary diseases and diagnose them. So the output, the endpoint is actually the clinical report. But um, most importantly, um, the diagnosis of cancer is right now our major driver. Um, what happened uh, the last few years is that we see a number of uh, precision medicine drugs coming into the market that require um, a clear understanding of the molecular profile of a tumor. And once we understand what that profile looks like, we can actually then pinpoint which drug needs to be prescribed. And so we deliver the entire end-to-end -end pipeline for this. Um, uh, to a, to a very diverse set of customers. Um, so the, the customers can be a small startup labs um, in hospitals, uh, can be regional testing labs that have multiple sites. And then on the high end, we support um, nationwide genomic initiatives. The largest one as of today is the Danish Genome Center. And they are right now going um, to uh, sequence every Danish citizen. They will take the whole genome and then they sequence this. And with our software, they analyze it and look at population level uh, data and see uh, what is specific about their population that is different from the general population. Um, <clears throat> the market that we penetrate is basically global. We have, um, um, in terms of presence, probably right now, the largest uh, market is for us, uh, Europe, um, uh, then Northern America, and then Asia, uh, and then to a certain degree, oh, and there's Latin America, there's Australia, Middle East, and Africa. So, uh, so that's basically in an upshot what the company does. Uh, we have uh, additional capabilities in the research space. That's actually what the company did uh, prior to that, which allows us to study um, the, the correlation between biomarkers and then uh, diseases or phenotypes and be leverages in different ways um, uh, on the research side. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Andreas. Um, so in addition to being named one of the fastest growing companies in America recently, Golden Helix was also published in the Journal of Precision Medicine. 
for your work diagnosing and tracking coronavirus infections through next generation gene sequencing. I'm wondering if you could explain this work in more detail and, and also why bioinformatics more broadly is important to working with COVID. Yeah, that, that work started basically as soon as the, the virus hit <clears throat> uh, here in the United States mainland. Um, we have relationships with labs in Europe and we're able to leverage that. So a couple of things that are interesting to mention when it comes to the bioinformatics side of it. Um, I'll start first on the research side. Uh, so we published a number of papers by now. Uh, we started with a smaller study of 1,500 genomes and looked at, okay, how does this... Um, this population of 1,500 genomes, how does it look like uh, if we, and we did uh, what is called a, a principal component analysis. And we can say that there is about three clusters uh, when you look at 1,500 that are, that are uh, distinct. Then we repeated that, uh, we published this data, we, uh, we um, did, redid the, the entire study with 46,000 and found already five clusters. So what that looks, what that means is there are now five clusters of this virus that have distinct um, uh, characteristics and they are uh, similar within itself, but still you can see an exploding number of variation that is occurring. and. Um, this study is now, we are not, we published those results as well, and this study is now being repeated with over 300,000 whole genomes of this virus. Uh, so bioinformatics is crucial to do this analysis, as there's no other way to do this today. Um, on the clinical side, um, we um, have built capabilities that allow us to do a um, very detailed analysis of um, viruses present in samples. And we can do a number of things. One, we can look at specific uh, strands and look how close or how different they are. And you know, you all read newspapers. We have here in the United States right now three major strands: uh, the UK one, the, the 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 South African one, and then there's a Brazilian one. Uh, and there will be more um, that have distinct properties. And it's important to know clinically what you what you're dealing with. And so we provide the capabilities to to assess that. Um, and with our pipeline, we can also do differential diagnostics. So we can just take the sample and then see what type of pathogen is actually there. So if you want to distinguish between a, um, a regular flu infection or some other bacterial infection and um, COVID infection, we can do this with our solution. So um, that's why we take it as an active field. We're doing research. We uh, apply for additional funding to to build out the software. So we expect actually to deliver more in that space going forward this year and next year. Wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, Tess and Carl, your startups are both still fairly early stage, your products and development, but has COVID um, played any kind of role in the work that you're doing and, and impacted your products and companies? Um, I can go first. I mean, first of all, we feel very fortunate to be uh, all computer based. So um, moving to remote and things like that is really not been a huge issue for us and you know we just feel so thankful that we've been able to you know keep moving along at, at the same pace and uh, accelerate it a little bit at that end but um this is andreas was talking about i think it just highlights you know the need um you know for more expertise and more capability in the bio space on, both on the computational side and on the high throughput testing side i think it really for us just highlights the importance of what we're doing well, for me, COVID started out being very good for me because all the committees and students and other responsibilities fell away because the university closed down. And so I was able to work by myself in the lab and really get quite a bit of the development of some of my trade secrets taken care of. So that was really wonderful last summer, but it really started to get old later on when my students came back and wanted to work and they couldn't and the university was open and then closed and open and then closed. and and uh, we lost some, some valuable experiments and time that way, but that's uh, to be expected. We're grateful that we were able to also work through it. Um, also on the other side, I received some COVID funding because my chemically defined supplements can really clean up the vaccine production process and, and help to grease the skids for that as well. So we've developed a couple of uh, of supplements for vaccine producing cell lines and uh, they should be ready for to be sold in June. So 
yeah, it's, it's accelerated a few things and decelerated others, and you just have to keep going forward. <laughs> it's been rocky, but uphill still. Uh, we have a question for Tess from the audience. Did you find an alternative to replace the use of fetal bovine serum for vaccine production or using specific cells from the fetal bovine serum in other proteins? Completely replacing fetal bovine serum with a chemically defined alternative that contains no animal derived protein. So it, it is all clean, chemical, no animal, no, no possibility of transmission of prions and other diseases. So yeah, it's completely chemically defined. And, and because it is, it has to be tailored for each cell type because fetal bovine serum is a big black box where it has absolutely everything you need and a whole bunch of stuff you don't and mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff that might be bad for you, but it has everything you need. Um, whereas my product is specifically what the cells need and nothing else. <laughs> so that relieves them of the contaminant load and the signaling interference and a lot of other things that are caused by components of serum that don't belong in a dish with human cells of different, different types. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One of the interesting um, sort of um, opportunities that we had in writing a series about um, all of like Montana's biotech companies to watch was it gave us a chance to survey the growth of this industry in the state. Um, Previously, we'd known about a handful of companies, but to see the body of research that's being done, the number of new startups in, in different exciting fields really uh, gave us a better sense of the, the incredible growth and opportunity that this industry presents. I wonder if each of you could comment on your experience and how you might describe Montana's biotech ecosystem. And also if, if you've seen it evolve in, in recent years and how, what that's been like. I'll go. I strong, I feel very strongly about Montana. My family moved here in 1963 when I was 14 months old. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not a native, but I'm close. Um, and uh, I think that Montana is a wonderful place for these kind of things because no matter what, whether you have reverse osmosis water or millipore water or your exchanging with a HEPA filter in your clean room, you still have to deal with the ambient issues. And Montana is one of the cleanest environments right now that we have in the United States that's producing any biotech. So when you're getting the water here and the, just the air in your clean room, um, all those things, when you look at them from a chemical standpoint are important. And having lived in some places that aren't so clean, um, every day I could smell the air in Houston, Texas, even after 30 <laughs> years. And I never quit tasting the water. It tasted like fingernail polish remover. Um, and people get used to that over a long time or if they're born in it, but you're, this, we're taking, especially in biotech, a lot of times we're taking cells out of a very, very specific niche where the environment is absolutely controlled. And we're putting them in a dish that's exposed to air. And of course we put them in incubators, try to keep all that, but you're still dealing with air. So just the environment, just our unsullied environment is I think a wonderful thing. Also, we have a vast pool of people who wanna work in this, in this state. And a lot of them have good education but didn't wanna leave and move to the city like myself. Um, and so I hope because I've been supported mainly by Montana and Montana State Development kind of grants that we can provide some good paying jobs for those people. And, Pardon to anyone here, but stop importing people from all over the place when we have them. I'd, I'd say, you know, I did graduate school at Montana State in Bozeman and then um, left. I worked in Boulder and Spokane and tried to stay around the Northwest as we had kids mm -hmm. during grad school and wanted to be within the shooting distance of family. Um, but, you know, being in Whitefish now, my wife is from here and it's you know, she's like, wouldn't it be cool to live in Whitefish someday? I said, honey, there will never be anything for me to do in Whitefish. Just get it out of your head and, you know, let's find a good place to live or whatever. And, and yet here we are. So the opportunity has arisen, and, you know, in, in Kalispell, Missoula, Whitefish, you know, Bozeman. Yeah. I love Bozeman, but it's a ways away, six, you know, good six hours. Um, I mean, the opportunities exist here that weren't here five years ago. 
Um, it's access to capital, the internet's better. Um, COVID, going back to that question, a lot of people are relocating Montana because they've gone remote and figured, hey, hey, guess what? We don't need an office anymore. I mean, I keep meeting people all the time that are relocating here and they just decided to get the heck out of Seattle or the Valley or whoever else. I mean, I think it's sped up, um, you know, kind of this remote working. COVID has probably sped it up 10 to 15 years for people moving here. Um, and I think it's going to probably keep going like that for a while. And remote has, oh, go ahead. our remote location has uh, been an issue with a, a few people that I've discussed things with, like Boston Scientific. They were like, well, we'd like you to move back here, you know, and then we'll give you all this stuff. And I just don't want to live there. And, and I guess that's a, it's a quality of life situation. And, and yeah, like, like you're kind of implying, Carl, it's like, if, it would be nice to be able to live in a quality environment and also do your high tech work. And so, yeah, we're getting there. Montana. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm like, yeah, we could live in Whitefish someday, but I'd have to be a real estate agent. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, getting the best of everything. Yeah. Andreas, did you have anything to add on this subject? <clears throat> no, 100%. I agree with everything that has been said. All right. Thank you. And a reminder to the audience, if you have a question, you're welcome to put it in the chat or if you have a question or comment you'd like to speak, uh, you can also turn off your mic and um, chime in at any point. So I'll pause a minute and allow for that. Hi, this is Erin. So Liz, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to say that it's so exciting to be on this call because I've actually had to leave Montana um, to kind of pursue the opportunities that I want to find. And there's so many talented and really smart people in Montana, but, um, you know, and there's just a lot of talent and not very many jobs. So it's really good to see, you know, three separate companies that are, that are starting up and growing and hopefully expanding and, you know, more of this is going to happen so we can, have people come back to Montana, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you for that comment, Erin. Um, and I will say this, these companies we're featuring today are three out of a much longer list of Montana tech companies to watch. So we will, uh, when we send the recording as a follow up to everyone who registered, um, and post the video online, we will also include a link to see that article and the longer list of companies because it is very encouraging to see the volume of, of growth in this field in the state. Uh, related to this question of workforce, uh, do you, what sorts of um, needs do you foresee in the future? And in your experience, have you been able to find the talent that you've needed to grow your companies? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's a very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> I will say uh, what was said before is true. Um, the uh, in our case MSU, but I think in general the MSUs the the, the university system is uh, very good. I re get almost all my new talent from MSU. Uh, computer science department um, does an excellent job. Uh, it's a great degree, and basically my entire development team is from there. Uh, same goes for the biology department. So we we get a lot of um, PhD and uh, master type people from that program, and uh, they they do excellent work. Um, we have sometimes to go outside of the the state um, and, and look for talent in areas like uh, sales and marketing, or IT. But in general, I think um, we're an attractive employer here in uh, Montana because we're, we obviously can provide a, a very uh, satisfying but also a rewarding environment and that is uh, looked for. Um, interestingly, from um, what we are seeing is that uh, we're, we're actually taking a little bit the education to the next level and um, have a, our own internal uh, training program. And um, so what, it, what uh, seems to be the case is that the technical talent that we have is excellent in the, in the details of their work. And where we add with education is primarily with uh, project management and communication skills. Um, because it is uh, today 
standard and or at least in my company standard that like a, a developer has to have some interaction with the customer when it comes to um, requirements gathering or sometimes with certain support situations where it requires that level of, uh, of skill. And then the non-technical talent, uh, we started actually um, to uh, uh, with the programming and a scripting course. So uh, we are actually ensuring that anyone in marketing, for instance, or in the support on the support side, IT anyways, but also operations, that they learn um, basic comprehension of programming, scripting, but also the development of UI as a user interfaces. And then for everybody, we're started, we started last year with um, languages because uh, my company is very internationally focused. And uh, basically everybody except me is, uh, is, was born here in the United States. So we're trying to make sure that people speak the languages of our customers. Um, uh, there's German, there's um, Spanish this year, and then we might look at other languages, Chinese, for instance, and so on. So that's, um, that's maybe so much about this on my end. Tu parles français? No. <laughs> Très bien. Elizabeth? <laughs> I, I look forward because I, I've been teaching for 10 years, a lot of teaching at the university during my graduate program, even my undergraduate program. Um, and I just meet so many promising students. And so my, my two lab techs right now are both students who work with me through in my graduate program and have continued to work with me. And they both would have had to leave and they didn't want to. And uh, so they are here still working with me and I hope to be able to provide those kind of good jobs. We are gonna, once we get our product on the market, we're gonna explode. And uh, we, I plan on hiring and training there's plenty of people out there that don't have any college that can learn how to do cell culture quite well. It's just a skill. They don't have to, they don't have to understand all the underlying things. So um, I am really hoping to do that. Bozeman is my hometown and, and I want to be part of, of building our community strong. Um, so I have had difficulty um, as a startup with limited funding because even the funding you do get most of it doesn't cover legal. And so the legal issue is one of the most expensive things. And it seems, it seems to me that it could single-handedly derail a startup, just not to have the, or be able to afford the right uh, legal counsel and uh, just even advice or anyway, it's all very complicated. And legal has been one of the biggest problems that I've had going forward. Um, even just to, if anybody's thinking about starting a startup, make sure you have a trademarkable name on a national level before you start. I've been through three names. Um, I was told I needed to get one that was trademarkable in Montana, so I did. <laughs> and then I had to get one that was trademarkable nationally. Um, and we looked up one and got it, and then it turned out it wasn't trademarkable. <laughs> and so you get exposure, and I've had now exposure under three different names. Um, and it's difficult with government grant writing too, because you have to certify everything over and over again. So it, that's been one of my big downfalls. If somebody with some experience had said, okay, first of all, if you're gonna go forward, let's get this name thing. Uh, that, that's been really important. And then all of the uh, IP and everything else, there's a wonderful MTIP and the tech transfer program at, at MSU is as helpful as, as they could anybody could possibly be. But there are just still issues in Bozeman at least that I find that places to be um, in incubators for people who need things like clean rooms and, and autoclaves, uh, I'm having to set up from scratch and uh, it's difficult. So those are the things that I've had issues with. Everything else, wonderful. The community here, financial, scientific, the MS MSU, all of it is extremely supportive. Yeah, I, I can jump in here too, and just to throw a plug out there too for the uh, Montana STTR SBIR matching funds program, um, because as Tess said, um, grants, SBIR, STTR grants do not allow you to pay for anything under commercialization activities. So, um, but with the Montana matching funds, um, you know, we've been able to put that towards market research and things like that, that we could not do grant funds out and you could, you know, I believe you could do legal. Um, on that as well. Um, we, to this point, have not had 
any problem um, getting good people. So we have, we actually have a combination of in-town people um, and remote. Um, so we're still a small team of five full-time employees. And then we have some um, remote contractors as well on, in software development. And, you know, we just recruited an employee in, um, out of Philadelphia and he's moving here, one out of there. Um, so we're super excited to have him. And, you know, even the people that start out remote and stay, say they're going to be remote, they come visit for some in-person time and uh, they get thinking real quick about making the move. Um, you know, we have talked about, you know, if we grow to a certain number, um, we have talked about, you know, opening a, an alternate location, whether hopefully somewhere warm so we could, you know, go one place or another, you know, to meet all together, um, something like that. But we have not had to do that yet. And challenges on our side, um, health insurance is a big thing for us. I mean, buying health insurance is a pain. We've um, small group stuff is just super expensive. I mean, we can pay for everyone's medical bills and have some super other plan thing and still pay for everyone's out of pocket expenses and still pay less than it costs to just to cover their premiums. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, but then there's laws changing too about, um, you know, these health share plans and things like that and QSARA and reimbursement. And I, I spend way more time on that than I ever want to. Um, and, we are a full technical team right now. Um, our next hire will be that uh, customer success type person and market research person. So um, we'll see how we have yet to find out how hiring will go there, but um, we've been super fortunate. Everyone has kind of just fallen into our lap <laughs> so far. Um, but like I said, we haven't had to scale up a bunch either. So we'll, we'll see what challenges we hit when that happens. Last question of funding. Uh, Carl, you mentioned the matching funds and also SBIR, STTR. One additional observation in, in surveying the whole list is the importance of SBIR and STTR grants to the bioscience ecosystem. Um, and then also the, the increasing availability of venture capital and angel and dollars that are, are coming into the state through um, Two Bear Capital and, and other funds. I wonder if um, one of you or all of you would indulge me in first uh, maybe explaining for the benefit of our audience what the SBIR and STTR grant programs do, whether you've received those funds yourself or other grants, and then also if you've had experience working with venture capital, what has that been like? I think I can answer the grant side, uh, because uh, we all not only got uh, some, uh, we're very grateful. Um, I'm also a reviewer in this process. I'm an uh, expert reviewer with the NIH. It's an, it's an excellent, excellent program. And I think we can be, as uh, scientists in the United States, super fortunate that we have this. What it is, is, is a, <clears throat> a simplified version. Um, you can uh, make a proposal to the NIH um, in the area of life science. It can be a, a proposal for a, a drug, some sort of treatment. It can be a software a solution, can be a medical device. And then they are uh, typically, they prefer to um, fund it in a phase one, phase two kind of an approach where the phase one is the proof of concept. And the phase two is then the actual implementation or the creation of the product. Um, it is not unusual for phase one funding to get 150,000 or more, I think 300,000 I've seen too. And then the phase two is, I think there's a sweet spot of $2 million that you can get. And what you have to write is basically uh, uh, for phase one, a shorter proposal, uh, six pages, and then the phase two is 12 pages plus uh, additional documentation about um, uh, a commercialization, commercialization strategy and uh, a little bit about your operation and um, about all the people that are involved. Um, it's actually quite a bit uh, paperwork and so on, but um, the fantastic thing about this program, it is non-dilutive. Once you receive it and you use it uh, appropriately, it's your money and uh, you don't have to give it back and it doesn't cost you any, any uh, equity or so. And uh, the NIH has been very generous uh, in 
in, in many fields with this. And I think a lot of, a lot of companies are only possible because of that. Um, the review process is very, very um, uh, detailed. Uh, so we typically look at this when we, when we meet, we have 35, 50, 40 uh, colleagues in a room. Three of us are leading uh, the assessment of a proposal. It's being then this, if the scoring uh, suggests that this is a worthy application, then we review it um, uh, in the large audience and everybody votes on it. And so it's, it's very detail oriented, but so I can vouch for the quality of the process, but I think everybody who has received it will say it's a tremendous uh, help for, for the work. Um, I personally, we have a bootstrap golden helix uh, so we didn't take any dollar uh, from anyone, uh, we just grew uh, organically. So I personally have no uh, personal relationships or uh, experience with dealing uh, with VCs in the company. So I would defer to my colleagues here and see what they, uh, what they experienced. I can talk to both. Uh, I put in now three SBIRs and being a new grant writer, I have not received the first two, but one of the beautiful things that SBIR does uh, is they send you back what's called the summary report and all of your reviewers say what was wrong yes. with your application. So my first two applications were uh, missing things that they really should have had. And I, so I've learned grant writing through SBIR. So they're doing a, an educational function there as well. But uh, also if you get the SBIR, you become a certified uh, provider for the US government. So if they have a contract for something, you don't have to compete, you get it. So it's an automatic, huge customer. So for my product, for instance, if I can get this SBIR or the next one I apply for, mm -hmm. uh, I become a preferred contractor for NIH, which would just be huge for my product. Um, as far as venture capital, I've heard terrible things about vulture capital, you know, and all this. And, and spoken to a lot of them across the country, having gone to several uh, venture capital or new business kind of startup things around the country. Uh, they just need to make their money back because they're living in the real world and they're not the government. Um, and in, in Montana, we have several excellent community oriented, really good, honest venture capital firms. Um, I'm working with one now called Next Frontier. They're located right here in Bozeman. There's another one called Two Bear out there. And basically it seems to me their function is they're getting money from everywhere, from the big time, the big leagues where we don't live because we don't want to live there. And they're con convincing them and getting their trust and them bringing that money here so that we can develop here in, in Montana. And that is a risky business. Any one of us could suddenly find out that, you know, our product is obsolete or somebody else did, you know, anything can happen. So they're taking that huge risk. They do expect something in return, but I've found it's, been very reasonable and it's ongoing support. It's not a one-time thing. Once they're in, they stay with you. You have a partner. I've actually received quite a bit of financial advice and like, what do they mean by series A? And what do they, you know, all this from directly from my investor, Next Frontier. He just is always there for me for lunch or coffee and talk to me about the, the whole financial world, which I don't have a PhD in. <laughs> so um, that's been extremely helpful. Because like I say, you don't just get money, you get a partner. And with SBIR, you don't just get money, you get a preferred government contract down the line. So um, there is a lot of good support. There's a, just a few holes I talked about earlier, you know, that we could maybe apply our creative minds to helping to fill sometime. But, uh, but I have found that venture capital has been uh, extremely helpful to me. And also all the small Montana things like this organization and Ascend out of Seattle, uh, it's, or Vertici out of Seattle put up a pro project called Ascend, and they were very, very helpful. Got me to bio this year and um, and helped me out with a micro grant, mini grant. And the state of Montana has many development grants where they're just really, really trying to get out there and help us. Um, and like, like Andreas was saying, sometimes the application processes can be extremely lengthy and detailed, but they've got to be careful with that money too, because that belongs to the American people. I think that we're, they're doing a pretty good job so far. And, uh, and if you want to do it, there are people out there that will help you. Yeah, I think I, think, I can speak to both of those because we have um, gotten STTR just a phase one and uh, been rejected on a couple phase twos. 
yeah. uh, mainly because of our commercialization plan. Um, but uh, yeah, so STTR is great. It does take a lot of effort, a lot of paperwork, um, and you may or may not get it. So I mean, we were looking, we've, we've kind of started to view SBIR, STTR as, um, you know, a possible way to get new things started, but not a way to fund your core business or things you need to do now anyway, because the timeline's too long and it's uncertain um, to where, you know, VC can be uh, much faster and, you know, more, you know, the amounts, you know, the people, you know, you just, um, you know, with grants, you throw the stuff out there and they give you a decision back. It's not a discussion, you know, that you can have with these other ones and you can talk different ways. Um, but going through the peer review process and writing the thing out really does help clarify your direction for the company too. As you write out the commercialization plans in the phase two and your research plans and timelines, it kind of forces you to do stuff that you need to do anyway. So, so going through the writing process, I think is really important and brings a lot of clarity and money is great. And in our case with an STTR, it solidified a a relationship with uh, Stanford and the ENCODE project um, and just having that validation say, hey, we got this through. Reviewers thought what we're doing is important. Partners think we're important. Um, you know, so that's probably maybe even more valuable than the money. Yes. Um, I had with Carl, I have uh, one additional uh, thing that we talked about is a lot um, in our review meetings. It's almost like this for commercial for companies that are already commercial in one way or the other and have a, uh, a business. That part is almost simpler because uh, you just describe how you go to market, right? So I, in my one, I just write out how my marketing mix look like and how my sales strategy looks like the process. It's just like like a rehashing of what I do anyways. But if you're really early on, that's almost the most difficult part because you have a lot of unknowns, right? But yet you have to write it in a convincing way so that someone believes you're, you're mean it, right? So, yeah. And, and in the software side, I mean, on grants, they really prize innovation is rated, rated really hard yes. and they try to fund risky things. And in software, it's like, I know this is something we can do to, you know, so they want contingency plan. Well, what if your experiment comes back? I mean, they're really worded for kind of drug discovery, diagnostic discovery, where you have a hypothesis in the phase ones where you test it, where you try, it sometimes feels like you're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Um, but you can definitely do it. Um, I will be, um, just between you and me, I would be open to give you, uh, give you a little bit of an insight in this process and also some pointers because you can overcome it. There are five criteria that they're looking yeah. at. And um, uh, you can, you can get, get some money as a software company, but we should take this on offline. I'm happy to talk to you about that. I would love to join you on that. Oh, sure. Well, why don't we do this? <laughs> the three of us, of course. No yeah. <laughs> on that subject, you know, there, with IT, I'm sure you guys find this because it's, it's, it's evolving so fast. And I, what I find is kind of a weakness in government programs in general is uh, FDA is a prime example. And I think SBIR and probably most of the grant writing is the same. If you're changing a paradigm, if you're absolutely changing something like I'm, I'm changing a foundational piece of cell culture. You know, there's billions in it for us if we can convince people that what they've been doing and what they're comfortable with isn't the right thing. And uh, so we wrote, we wrote for our NIH, for our SBIR, it's about purifying and coming up with more pure forms or more better ways to purify uh, serum. There is no PA announcement for replacing serum, uh, but I applied to that because people just don't think that far and so it's very about half the scientific community says yeah great let's do this and the other half go what's so innovative we have we already have serum and we have serum substitutes and they don't recognize that the albumin protein is in there and that does the same thing has all the problems the serum has right in this and, and so all these different things and so when you're coming at something from a very different angle and you're very very new and creative we're way out in front like you guys seem to be um they aren't equipped to evaluate that. They're equipped, like you were saying, it's kind of seems to be set up for drug discovery. It's, it kind of seems to be set up for your average pharmaceutical, you know, or your average, or what, what's been done for the last 30 years, but we're doing what's gonna be done for the next 50 years. And it requires a different set sometimes of parameters to be, 
to be reviewed even, and they just aren't there um, because the government's always going to be 10 years, 20 years behind what's actually ha happening on the innovation floor. And so when you're looking to the government for something, you're saying, well, I'm shooting off a rocket into space. And they're like, but will you be using a combustion engine or horse? And you, you have to answer that question and you're not using either. So then you have six pages to explain. It's, it's extremely difficult and it, and it will remain so because we can only regulate according to what we've known before and what's coming down the pike is entirely different. So that is a big part of what of the difficulty in straddling what's what's happening in our businesses and in the world and and what can be justified or or explained even to a government regulatory body in six pages or less. <laughs> I feel for you, Tess, doing the, uh, you said you went through several name changes, but uh, updating Duns and Bradstreet and stuff, which thankfully I think is going away. I mean, even just, I mean, all we require really is office space and an internet connection. So we've moved several times and that, that's a big motivation for us to not move is because I don't want to update that with the government uh, style of the government sites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm still Optima Labs according to the government because I didn't dare change that because they would find some registration. There's seven of them online you have to have to file these government grants. And if one of them disagrees with the other in any jot or tittle, one time it was the comma after my name, between my name and ink, that didn't match up with Duns and Bradstreet, uh, the comma was different. <laughs> okay, and so that can throw off a $250,000 or $2 million grant, something like that. And so it's, yeah, that's extremely difficult. One of our partners uh, in putting on this webinar and in, in serving the bioscience industry in the state is the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative. And they have recently formed, and I'm wondering if, um, Hallie, if you're on, Hallie Widner, if you could share with this group uh, both what the initiative is and also what resources do you have available to help serve some of the needs we're hearing about today. Right, can you hear me? Yep, yes. okay. Yes, okay, so um, the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative is a federally funded contract award from the SBA. It's actually one of seven awards, so that's pretty good recognition for Montana. And our goal is kind of to grow the bioscience ecosystem and support all of these entrepreneurs and startups and small businesses around Montana. And we have a fourth F fund, which the objective is to provide direct assistance to Montana bioscience small businesses. And um, it, this fund is designed for maximum flexibility and support of new and established businesses in the bioscience industry. So I can drop that application link in the messages. And I also, Carl and Elizabeth have both tapped into it before. So that is great. And then we also are working on building more incubator space and wet lab space for um, bioscience firms in Missoula. And that's part of the Montana Innovation Corridor Gateway Project. So um, yeah, that's what's going on right now for the cluster initiative. Brigitte can add more if she would like to the um, Innovation Corridor Gateway Project. All right, oh, I think <laughs> says we're good, everything's covered. Uh, in these last few minutes, I wanna make sure that if, uh, if anybody in the audience has a burning question that you have a chance to ask it, questions or comments. Yeah, I actually have a question. This is Shannon Lewis and I'm the director of the State Workforce Board. So first of all, um, I'd really like to commend um, all of you for really looking at your whole workforce and, and looking at training and education and how you build pipelines into your industry. I guess that my um, question is about um, the funding and with Montana being a rural state and you guys were talking a lot about putting in for federal funding and I for sure, or any kind of government funding. And I just wanted to ask, do you all feel that you um, have additional barriers to funding, whether that's through philanthropy, angel investment, government, government granting, because you're based in a more rural landscape than you would if you had access to other capital streams in a more urban setting? So just kind of throwing that out there as a 
uh, a question. Well, the the federal grants um, have been found us uh, a few times, so I can't say that we, uh, as a company, had any difficulties to obtain them. I know a, no a number of my colleagues benefited from them. I don't think there's any uh, barrier. So the VC VC space is a little bit different. VCs are um, actually interesting enough thinking about geographical distance or proximity because they, they like to go to meetings and they like to have conversations with you. And maybe these things are also changing, but they typically tend to focus the investment area uh, around an, uh, the proximity of where they can actually physically go. And then of course there are exceptions to that. But as that was said, we have now in Montana, I think um, a number of good venture capitalists and a few names were mentioned. And actually in that industry, uh, it's not uncommon then to build consortia, so to pool resources with other VCs that they have relationships with. So, um, so I have to believe that it's not a real constraint uh, in, in that regard. I think we're very fortunate otherwise to live in Montana because as it was said before, it's for the talent that works in our companies. It's actually very, very, very great thing to have a work-life balance that is uh, attra attractive. And now we're talking about millennials being in charge almost, right? And running uh, functions in our company, they want to uh, have a lifestyle that they can live here, right? where they can go outside, play after work and not stuck in traffic and so on. So it's, uh, I think in many ways we're actually, and maybe even through COVID uh, in a more accelerated way, see that we're becoming very, very attractive as employers here in this country, in, this, in the state. Yeah, I mean, for us, I mean, I, I feel like I've been very fortunate being in the right spot at the right time and just meeting the right people. I mean, there's, you have to put yourself out there, but then you, you just have to meet the right people that can help you get to where you want to go and that can share the vision. And um, with us, you know, we've developed a relationship with Two Bear Capital and with Mike Gogan before they were Two Bear, before he started Two Bear Capital. So um, just, I mean, that was... Um, part luck, I think, honestly, um, if I will take it. And so we've had that um, strong relationship. And, you know, I go skiing with one of their partners every Friday, or we hike up the mountain every, you know, every Friday morning early, you know, and just having that availability is just, I feel like we've just been so fortunate um, to be able to do um, what we're doing. And, you know, as Tess said, VC can be you know, a blessing or a curse. Um, you really do, especially in the earlier stages, you know, they say, you know, if you get to a series B, C, maybe you might just want the money by then. But ser <laughs> series B or A, I mean, those are strategic partnerships where you're figuring out the business, you're figuring out the product, and you really need you know, some help and guidance. And, and I think, you know, um, the VC firms here are, are, are very good at that. And, you know, I think We've talked a lot about VCs, but just the angels um, here too. Um, I think we haven't been brought up, but we haven't worked with them, but um, great things that are happening with the angel ones too. Maybe each of you in two sentences, could you tell us what's next for your, your company in 20? Should I go first? What'd you say, two seconds? Two sentences. Two things. Finish getting our facility, our new facility made and put out product by June. Those are the two things that are happening this year. Andreas? Um, I tell you what, we were lucky. We booked 40% of our 2020 revenue in the first week of January. So we're, uh, so my expectation, my problem, only my problem, problem is that the expectations of my board is now skyrocket high. Uh, it's basically to deliver that and then hopefully get a third nomination for uh, the Inc. 5000 list. That's what my goal is. And Carl, how about you? Yeah, I can probably sum it up in one word and that's commercialization. I mean, we've been all <laughs> cool and, uh, you know, developed some really cool capabilities. So it's um, user growth and partnerships. Um, and definitely focus on the commercialization side now that we've gotten to a point where we can show people something instead of just talking about what we're going to do. Um, so um, it's good to be at this point. 
Well, thank you so much, Tess, uh, Andreas, and Carl for sharing your companies with us today. And thank you to the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative for partnering with us on this event. A recording and a transcript of today's presentation will be available on our website and also mailed out to everyone who registered. And thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. you.